to sit down if you don't mind, um, partly because I tend to be rather long-winded, and so uh, we have to be here out of here in an hour. So if I read it, I can get in all the stuff that I want to say, and I won't go in on various tangents. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. No problem? Okay. In 1880, the well-known American art critic and what we now would call influencer, Clarence Cook, wrote a 35-page booklet entitled, What Shall We Do With Our Holes? And this is the title, this is the cover of the booklet. To understand the context in which it was written, it's important to know that it was published by a paint and wallpaper company and included five full-page wallpaper designs in black and gold by Lewis Comfort Tiffany, Tiffany and Samuel Coleman. So it was kind of, in a way, a commercial publication. The text of the pamphlet started with the sentence, quote, most of us find ourselves nonplussed when in the process of fitting up and furnishing our houses, we come to the question, what shall we do with our walls, end quote. Cook's line, I think, sounds familiar to all of us. Uh, those of you who have moved into a new house, a new apartment, or even a student dormitory room, know the conundrum of what to do with the walls. And I think that this has been a question for throughout history. Uh, as long as people have lived between walls, even the walls of caves, they may have wrestled with it, as this cartoon <laughs> suggests. Now, the historic period we are concerned with today is not the Stone Age, but rather the last quarter of the 19th century, approximately 1870 to 1900. It was the end of the Victorian era, the Gilded Age in America, the Belle Epoque in France and, and Northwestern Europe. During that period, design in general and domestic interior design in particular was dominated by the aesthetic movement, an artistic movement that originated in Great Britain and from there spread to the British colonies and the United States and in a somewhat modified form to the European continent. We will define the aesthetic movement in a moment, but for now it is important to know that when it came to domestic interior design, it revolutionized the treatment <coughs> of the interior walls. Sometime in the 1870s, architects and decorators began to claim the wall as their domain and were no longer willing to leave it to the homeowner to decorate white or neutrally colored walls with their family portraits or choice pictures. As you see here, in this painting from 1866, so it's really shortly before 1870, where the walls are in a kind of a sage green, and you see it's completely covered with um, pictures. And that's exactly what the aesthetic movement hates. So and this is what we're talking about. Indeed, Clarence Cook, in quote, what shall we do with our walls, wrote that by 1881, when he published his booklet, attitudes towards wall treatment had changed so drastically that, quote, what was possible to a former generation is impossible for us at a later time. Even if the old-fashioned simplicity of walls, bareness, as we would call it today, were agreeable to us, it would be difficult to maintain it. So greatly has the condition of the market for beautiful things and things combining use and ornament changed within very few years, end quote. The new fashion was for painted and, and, st and or stenciled walls or for elaborate wallpapers uninterrupted by paintings of other or other wall decorations. Indeed, so important did wall treatments become within the overall concept of the interior that decorators not merely advised against, but were outright hostile to all works of art that destroyed the integrity of their wall surfaces. And here you see uh, a uh, reconstructed room in the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, uh, it is the uh, dressing room of the Arabella Yarrington Warshams um, house that was in New York on, uh, on 54th Street. 
the esteem, you know, that there's no paintings on the wall at all, just a very rich kind of wallpapers. Paradoxically, uh, this emphasis on aesthetic wall treatments coincided with the explosive development of the contemporary art market, manifested in the multiplication of contemporary art galleries and dealerships. And this created what in the subtitle of my talk I refer to as the battle between decorative and fine arts. And it raises the question how art dealers in the 1870s and 1880s managed to sell art, especially paintings, to a middle class clientele that followed the decorated fashions dictated by the aesthetic mood. 